Um, so Mark really first uh, is an architect and visiting professor here at the CAS and oversees now the MA in spatial planning and urban design. Um, he established the uh, <laughs> urban strategy consultancy East, gaining a reputation for a patient and provocative role in regeneration and planning and has made a big contribution to the planning and shaping of development across London through the formulation of policy and the creation of planning frameworks and master plans during his time leading Design for London and serving on the Mayor's Design Advisory Panel. Um, and after that, we will have Owen talking. Um, I, I don't know exactly what he's going to be discussing, but um, <laughs> we'll hear. Um, but yeah, Owen's a, a writer and journalist based in London, writes around architecture, politics, culture, and various intersections between them. Um, he's written various books and things like that, and essays there's a couple of them over there and other things. Um, and also um, has quite a few blocks. Um, and I, yeah, I'll pass you over to Mark now and we'll see how it goes. Thank you. Wow. Uh, well, I, I must say that um, um, this morning has. Uh, prompted some great discussions, and uh, I, I actually ended up uh, stuck downstairs having a great uh, 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 discussion, partly set off by Alberto's uh, critique and conspiracy theories, uh, and uh, I'm just musing around that. Uh, my 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 story that I'll do a little bit of uh, now is uh, quite just do it. Uh, focused, warts and all. I don't know whether what I've been doing is right or wrong, to be honest, at all. But I, I will tell you about my engagement in shaping change in London, a few case-by-case -case, uh, examples, uh, and within that, the process of capturing resources and money to do the things that we made a judgment were worth going for. But just a, a, a little bit of um, personal context. Um, <coughs> the, uh, where I appeared uh, in my 20s, like you do, at the start of your working life, was reacting to the 80s mood. So, an architect, um, the architectural scene of that time with its esoterica and what seemed preposterously rarefied disengagement from what you could see around you if you looked uh, carefully and connecting more readily and not alone in this with the sparkier parts of the left and the spirit of those years and the mood of criticism and some discontent with all that no such thing as society story <coughs> that was being uh, played and the recognition uh, that there were losers as well as winners and that aestheticize it, of course, a little on photos, um, but what this was reminding us is that there were big dysfunctions and there were problems, there were places of poverty in the country we were in. I wanted to engage in that in some uh, way, in <coughs> for someone with a design capability, an engagement in the real places to work with making the country better in some way, and to work on the major components, physically and economically and socially, the streets and the parks and the schools and the housing and all the stuff that felt a bit not the centre of attention in architectural discourse at that time, and an interest in all the types of bits of urbanness. And then 
jumping forward to 2001, missing out a few bits along the way, uh, I found myself working for the Mayor of London, and it was because of the trajectory that this effort set going with uh, Richard Rogers uh, and the task force producing this document in an attempt to figure out what to do about the challenge of UK cities at the time. And then, on the back of that, this unrepeatable coincidence of Kennedy inviting Richard Rogers, a team being set up, and that's how I found myself in that very strange uh, place. I thought I was reasonably uh, well engaged in the way stuff happened and reasonably well politi politicised and with an understanding, but of course I was dumped in this situation which I didn't really know much about and it was quite an eye-opener. And one of the things that struck me immediately was the unsophisticatedness of all the decision-making processes, the almost entirely unpolitical in any grand political narrative uh, or, or uh, set of beliefs nature of it all, in fact how ad hoc and day to day, not in an entirely negative way, in quite a refreshing way it was, and how very negotiation based it was. Now this is a this is a this is an article that is one of the few that I find myself enjoying uh, reading every now and then by those good Dutch people, Wouter and Michelle from Crimson. Uh, and I think this is about 15 years ago. This, because uh, I, I enjoy it, I'll read you a, a little bit. Now, this is about this whole question of change really being negotiated and blundered, even. Dutch city planners complain that 99% of their time is spent meeting people, trying to get the highway people to talk with the sports centre people, trying to get the railway people to stop their vendetta against the vegetable garden people, trying to convince the Shell refinery people that they should stop protesting against the McDonald's driving being built in front of their installations, convincing the telecom corporation to get a really good architect to build something spectacular in the middle of the city, etc., Picture the urbanist rushing breathlessly from meeting to meeting, having to beg for favours from rough neck specialists, corporate suits, whining environmentalists, racist neighbourhood committees, cold-blooded politicians and leering developers. All the while, he is dreaming about devising a beautiful urban plan that would be usable for at least 20 or 30 years. It would give the city a foundation to accommodate both change and continuity. The public, civic, collective city would be transubstantiated into this plan, while the short-term private interests would come to the fore in its architectural infill. This view of urbanism, he says, is imbued with the ideology of one coherent democratic civic authority versus a great many incidental, private, corporate bodies. And, I would add, it's hooked on a good versus bad construct that doesn't really ring true. It ain't as simple as that. The planner in this telling, though it could be a range of other characters in the process, is missing the point, in fact, what that character is regarding as the obstacles to a process are in fact the very process itself. It is ad hoc, this process. It flows in directions on aggregate, but not singularly willed or directed and never coupled to any grand intent or even conspiracy. So there we were. We got 
involved in techniques to get somewhere. We refine the technique of making good pictures that captured ideas. Green belt, green girdle, important in some little narratives. The fitting it all in challenge equals you need to do urban change with care equals shorthand design. It's important. Plans, little series here, plans trying to explain the challenges of shaping what get, got labelled London Thames Gateway and trying to persuade people that there should be some assertion of intent through planning, which there never was strategically. But just honing these skills to draw, because that's what we were good at, and explain because that's what we found we were good at. Making cases, this is one of the th things that I feel proudest of, actually, is making the case uh, for there being design guidance. Very real good English isn't that guidance. That's, in fact, the first time that there'd been prescription that applied similarly to the receivers of housing subsidy and anybody who wanted planning permission. Quite an amazing thing to pull off. And very pleased we were with some of the results as they started to come through. This is actually the first development that followed those standards before the standards were adopted because we had the leverage of the land being owned by the mayor. And we pulled off, for example, uh, much larger than usual external spaces in dwellings. You notice those balconies are giant, and that's the new dimensions that are required. We made the case again, trying to get people to get it through simple drawings. This is us explaining the distinction between what we refer to as inclusive change, nurtured, like planting seedlings versus sweeping change. Something you could tell was a bit of a consensus, but it just needed driving in. One is good, the other is bad, to diagrammatize it. And then we did things like a sparky initiative for urban design scholars and discussions this one was called Shaping a Better London at City Hall, and we coordinated the Mayor's Design Advisory Panel that really was just an excuse for a discussion, because discussions are always scarce, and a discussion that we could sometimes get the Mayor, to, that's, that's the Mayor with the blonde hair. Uh, because we needed to get to the Mayor to persuade him and you can't just say, hey mayor, can I meet you tomorrow? We helped get exhibitions going, here one focused on the future of Deptford. We learnt uh, some things about how to catch and steer urban change, how to build webs of people and collaborate, and uh, that we only could remain effective by keeping cheeky and staying sparky. Connecting with London's creative energy. Rather lucky to be in such a creative, infested city. And we learned that you need to be opportunistic and seize the moment. High streets, we noticed, were the issue of the moment for a little while, as is the way in our culture, when recessions bite and make empty shops, noticeable on a big scale, and it starts hitting the national media. So we therefore pushed this topic that we wanted to push anyway. Opportunistically, this was the moment, and indeed, through that, captured 120 uh, million. I'll come onto that a bit more later. We learned to accept, in the spirit of Walter and Michelle's essay, 
that nothing turns out how you expect, and sometimes all we manage to influence, of course, was just the colour. <laughs> Here in Leighton, businesses that were hastily relocated on the mayor's land that he randomly owned to make way for the Olympics. <clears throat> we learnt early that if you do the drawings, you win, if that's one of your skills. Drawings that can be understood. And we told stories and we minted phrases. I'm still hoping that I will get a pound for every phrase minted and I'll be rich. And we even had a little go to get some witty prizes that would keep us visible and seen as innocent. And here I am telling stories, done a lot of that. And we focused most of our efforts on projects in places, catching and steering and telling stories, giving advice, helping with process. So all of this is a manoeuvring. This is where we worked, that team, Design for London, until it accidentally dissolved away a few months ago. And there's another whole story. A whole way of working by engaging and pushing forward change in hundreds of small parts with lots of process to keep it rolling and a little bit of worrying about whether what we were doing was right, but ultimately we just had to believe that we might be closer to right than wrong. And a lot of process and production that drove forward that process and the discussions that go with it. And so here's an example, and it's about Raynham and the marshes. Winding back the clock a bit earlier than my involvement in the mayor, as just a random person, and then a random person that evolved into having a little practice east with the collaborators there. We thought, hmm, spent a lot of years critiquing and causing trouble, which is actually what I had been doing before. Um, let's do something propositional that can feel very positive. That's what we should do. Let's use an idea to swing people around. Let's use it to open discussions. So we came up with this thing called River Places. It was this idea that these two marshy chunks on the edges of London by the Thames could be something more public, more enjoyed, more special. And we started pitching that idea around. And actually those were two documents that I pulled together of all the correspondence around pursuing this idea. And it's a pretty amazing record of talking to lots of boroughs, some counties, some port authorities, and some ministries of defence, all kinds of them to own the land on some of it, and etc, etc. And then, when I was in this job with the mayor, trying to get this visible, because it just so happened that Ken Livingston had said this thing in his election campaign, if I get elected mayor, you won't be able to build your big, cheesy theme park or your big exhibition centre or your big whatever the other one was. These were all the proposals for what should be built on Rain and Marshes. It's actually the place that uh, Margaret Thatcher had a little go to persuade Disney to build um, Disneyland on. She said, hey, you can build it here. Ken Living has stood and said that's not going to happen, so that gave us a window, and of course getting Richard Rogers there, and took the advisory group, and through that, uh, the mayor interested. So this was all a momentum building exercise, both on the um, protection of the space from development, which is believed was uh, right, and for its biodiversity importance, 
as well as its people possibility, uh, but also trying to engineer um, cash and people's time and efforts. And we, we managed to weave this into this whole story uh, uh, called the East London Green Grid. And we made these frameworks which were really like pitching documents for projects that people had in mind or had on the back burner but didn't really have the money for. We made our plan. We got some projects going. So here we are at Galleons, which is the first time that you could properly get to the riverside at Galleons. And this was the uh, new bridge connection made near the bow flyover junction where people keep it squashed on their bikes. And um, this was the riverside path on the Lee and Avery Hill. And busy crafting, this is just a little example of crafting the argument. This is sitting down and thinking, ooh, we shake this argument often into a PowerPoint. And this was, this was the PowerPoint then. This is the first two pages of the PowerPoint with my notes, because I got this little chance to pitch it to the mayor. This, what should we do then, was really what this was about, because all the money's gone. Uh, and this said, oh, hey, Mayor, you know that Barking Riverside development that we were all working on and you were very keen to do? Well, the subsidy that's required to make that happen, the public money that you were assuming you would find, is four times what your budget has shrunk to for all this kind of stuff. So we need a different strategy. We said, hey, the people resource is one thing. You've now got these people together in City Hall. That's an opportunity. Hey, you know, there's some things we've been doing in Raynham, and that's maybe a model. So here we are. We did this little run through. You know what's happened in Raynham is this careful package of action where, celebrated in a magazine here, of a type not quite seen before in a struggling place on the eastern edge of London where uh, industry and wild space and suburb and a bit of a relic old village come together in a really clunky way and it's quite struggling. We helped set loose some strategies, we helped revive events, this is the Mayfair and the old village that had lapsed, try and get people keen again. We helped the process of making a new link between the old village and the giant uh, Tesco's. We planned a new end to the village, which is still allegedly about to happen, uh, where the station is, a new place for buses, a new library, a few flats, some public rooms. The amazing 17th century Raymond Hall, the abandoned garden, it's been restored, and here's a bloke with blonde hair, planting flowers. He just happened to be there, and just happened to, it's a few weeks before the election. Yeah, the election. And on the edge of the village, we got a great architect to design some small industrial units, and they were a big success. This was before they were let, but they were snapped up quite quick, which was heartening. And access to uh, the marshes to make them enjoyable by the public, back to what I had wanted to make happen. Remarkable wild place in London. I hope you've all been there. We helped clever architect Peter Beard propose this new slope across the railway um, and to the marshes sort of project you can never get to happen. Half walkway on wooden legs, half earth bank. Here it is, ready for use. Miraculously taking people where they want to go. Straight down onto the marshes or folding off to the side into the industrial area if you work there. Uh, new walkways over the wet places through the wild. New bridges over the ditches towards the River Thames where you couldn't go before. That was a, a firing range. Uh, stone chunks the size of cows. New places to watch the birds. Education rooms on the water's edge. So it's all magicked up, you see, the money for this. Some Euro money, some good pitching. RSPB mounted a big campaign. They came in and managed to buy it from the Ministry of Defence and so on. We improved the feel of the industrial 
areas, we help plan new industrial on some more land that the mayor randomly owned, and a new riverage space we got built. Still to come, a new cafe, taking donations afterwards. Cafe, Hacienda must be built. This is the Three Crowns Cafe, because once there was a pub of that name here. And this was, uh, it's already got the lay-by, the truck lay-by. It says that there should be a truck lay-by, so that people from the industrial area could use this cafe too. The old concrete barges are now loved. Now people come here, bird-watching people and normal people, alongside each other in harmony. <laughs> and so, so remember, this, this is all, this, that was like the pitch to the mayor. You could do this kind of thing, and uh, um, uh, even though the money's tight, and he said yes, and uh, he got the Out of London Fund, Ooh, that's all very low res, it's interesting. And uh, so then there was another round, and that ended up with another load of projects. Um, and then the riots happened, and then some more money appeared, and those places got some money, and then the mayor said, oh, yeah, those places need to get some money to those for. Um, so they were slipped in, and then these were all the places from another program, the London's Great Outdoors program. Um, and we did all those things. And another story, and now I'm running out of time, but another little example of this. This was around public space. So you know this Trafalgar Square transformation had happened, and we realized that was a success, it was popular. So then there was an effort to pitch some others. Exhibition Road was pitched, these are visualizations of it before it happened. And we said, hey, you know, we looked at this as inspiration. The 1963 Highway Sign Manual seemed to indicate that's what you can do. There can be a sort of calm, simple modernity about the public space. We can focus instead of on all the designerness uh, of regeneration mode landscape schemes. So we can focus on just the recalibration of the space, try to keep the infrastructure actually pretty simple. So we persuaded everyone to do guidance on that how you can simplify, how you can do the details well. Three minutes left! Whoa! And engineering drawings. And then we managed to persuade the mayor to do this 100 public spaces program that had a budget of zero. And we did an exhibition, Open City, in Somerset House, and it felt quite glamorous, and it was very popular. And then a new mayor came, and we said, you know that initiative that there was with the previous mayor? Well, this is a completely different initiative with a completely different name, and he bought it. He actually said, I don't care if it's the same as the old mayor's thing, I still want to do it. Uh, and then we got into overdrive again. PowerPointing, presenting, telling that story, this is another one, to the mayor. This is what, oh mayor, if you were a great mayor, was a subliminal message you could do. Uh, he took it on board, and this is him launching the London's Great Outdoors initiative, and with it the Green Grid that I mentioned, but a whole program across London of public space. It's mostly with Transport for London uh, money, that space, and there it is a few weeks uh, later. Spill out space for that cafe. Green spaces. Brixton, Covent Garden, Exhibition Road got built. For good or ill, I think good. Most of these are very good steps forward. That was Acton, this is Oldgate, right outside here was a big road before, and that's in Sutton, and that's in Woolwich. And then we pitched a story on high streets. What's all this? It's those everyday places. Oh my God, there are 600 of them. There's something quite significant. That's what happens when you look at the ground floor uses. Was our little pitch for resources and interest. Strip away all the residential and the green and you get a pattern and that's the high street what's clustered around these movement networks. They've got names across London, there's 600 of them. Look at one all the way across from Uxbridge to Romford and we did that with Fiona Scott and Gord Scott's help and what a good job they did right from the east through the middle, 51 kilometres from Uxbridge to Romford, 6,500 businesses with their front doors 
nearly 80,000 jobs, and we said, you know what, that's like Canary Wharf, and it's a very different type of animal, but that's just one of them stretching across London. This is really significant, and we should take it seriously. We shared these amazing drawings from Fiona Scott and said, this is something very intense and substantial. We mounted the killer arguments, we thought. We got URS to help us with some economic justification. And then we could say, you know, nearly 50% of businesses outside central London are on a high street. One and a half million employees work on or within 200 metres. And, you know, there's huge growth capacity here and London's struggling to grow. This is London's biggest collection of places that are good to grow and ready to go. And I'm going to finish with this one, a story of barking, because I like it. My dog's called Barking, and um, it's my longest involvement in a place. You'll be getting the idea, perhaps, of the way we went about this opportunistically, but based on a, a belief that we were pushing for something worthwhile. The potential was clear in this place, um, but it wasn't happening. The growth potential to build. Uh, uh, we helped to build an enthusiasm around that and get it happening. Um, and we did some of these, as of many of these high street places, these light touch, uh, um, engineered, orchestrated things to build some uh, enthusiasm, uh, give people a sense that there was something starting to happen and some of those things have managed to snowball. This is pioneering on the high streets and in the market and a new sparkiness uh, bringing in the people. Again, very orchestrated uh, but very successful the footfall in that place has been growing. People have been turning back to uh, the high street until recently, uh, to about five years ago, this was just a rudimentary surface car park. The place has been coming to life, uh, and some of it's spontaneous. There's some sort of self-organized events happening. This is the council organized, uh, the winter festival, and the Christmas uh, season there in this new space, it was a surface car park. Here's the town hall fizzing, like what they should. No doubts about that. Local democracy is something, warts and all, that is very important, and town halls should fizz. And there is real, in my view, my interpretation, quite genuine re-emergence of civic pride in that place, the public space network, it's been reconfigured piece by piece, all the money, hard won and argued for. And on the back of other things, usually on the back of infrastructure, roads, buses, that sort of stuff, slowly adjusting. The new arcade, the apprentice run cafe, a new hotel, a new health centre, here the library and the Tom Dixon public chandeliers, a new swimming baths coming soon, and a new supermarket that might outcompete the one over by the North Circular, and a new arboretum, and some quite decent, even though the balconies are a bit small, housing. New places that seem to be working out well, the very heavily populated, lots of good through routes through them, people are coming as they weren't, a bold transformation, but all based on nurturing what was there already. By and large, well designed, very much negotiated, with plenty of working together. These were actually made from the, uh, the famous blue fence around the Olympics. Um, and I think actually they all these projects work better because there was a, a free bird uh, team, which we uh, were. And then being spun, and we did a lot of this kind of effort to make sure that this kind of work was validated in cool places. Here a Euro prize for public space that Muff 
got for their great work there. So that was the day I chatted with Boris Johnson in the cafe at City Hall. This is actually uh, this was a, an amazing thing that happened, I think, the week after he got re-elected. And I was sitting in the cafe and he came across and he said, Ah, oh, out of London fund, yeah, it got me re-elected. I don't know, shit. <laughs> that wasn't our intention, man. But um, never mind. And, and I, I just mentioned this example because I happened to be sitting with this a woman, I can't remember who she was. It wasn't the one I didn't know who she was earlier, but one of those kinds of people who was urban studies um, kind of person from New York, and she was visiting us. And, and she was clearly a bit amazed by this situation of this mayor just passing by with his cycle helmet. And she couldn't imagine Bloomberg, uh, um, I think it was still Bloomberg then, uh, this happening. And so she, she, she rather rashly got her iPhone out and said, oh, can I take a picture? So he, that, that actually was him looking in the mirror glass to kind of check he looked all right for this photograph. And, um, and of course, it, that was the end of the conversation. He then left slightly embarrassed by this thing. And our conversation didn't continue. And of course, I was readying myself to say, hmm, yes, you know, we need to have a conversation about the next possibility. But that didn't happen. And uh, we didn't last long, actually. I'd say we lost the political advisors who were supporting us. But I just think this is a great example of the ad hocness of it. And this whole thing around urban change from my way of observing it, is a story shaped by individuals and collaborations pushing good things, and of course often pushing bad things, and when pushing good things, inadvertently pushing bad things. And most people pushing bad things are convinced that they're pushing good things. And it's a story of thousands of small acts, changes, happening at that level. So yes, it's possible to trace trajectories of urban change and landscapes of who wins and who loses, and what gets lost as well as what's gained. Histories of urban change, of the processes, of the intentions and the accidents, the initiatives and the consequences of them can all be overseen, and it's crucial to do all that constantly to keep discontent going, to keep looking. But there is no conscious plan being followed. There is no conspiracy, no good versus evil dynamic struggle. There are no clear monsters. No one is pulling all of the strings with a show narrative in mind. And that, I believe, to finish, is actually quite a liberating observation. Thank you.